Hello and welcome to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. I'm your host, Art, and I am bedecked in tinsel and full of eggnog, so that can only mean one thing. It's time to deck the halls. Let's get started. I'm always so grateful when listeners reach out and share with me a Christmas story. Mackenzie is a listener, and she sent me an email a little while ago, a couple months ago now. She says, Christmas is my absolute favorite time of year, and it truly fills my heart, and it's just something that I will always cherish. I have many Christmas traditions and memories that I've had over the years, and it's really hard to choose one, but if I had to choose, my favorite Christmas memory is more a tradition than memory. But the first year I started this tradition, I knew it would be a memory that I would not forget. My favorite Christmas memory is on every Black Friday, me and my mom would go to our favorite mall and go Christmas shopping for our family members and spoil ourselves a little bit on sales. After all the fun shopping, we would come home and we would get our Christmas bake on. We would make the best Christmas cookies, including cutout cookies, chocolate chip, peppermint, and my great-grandmother's Pizzelli Italian cookie recipe. As me and my mom would make the cookies, we would watch Hallmark Channel's Christmas movies, which me and my mom both love. We would enjoy the special moments, and I love that day every year because it was like our Christmas Girls Day. I will always remember this memory and tradition, and I hope you enjoyed hearing it. Well, Mackenzie, thank you so much for writing in. I hope this year you get to enjoy that tradition again. I know COVID might change a lot of people's Black Friday plans. To be honest, Black Friday has never really held much interest to me, but I love that people have turned it into a special thing. So I hope that you will be able to get out there and shop safely and that you uh, maybe even spoil yourself a little bit and enjoy watching those Christmas movies. This honestly, maybe I've been inside too long now, but this sounds like a wonderful day to go do some Christmas shopping and end it with baking goodies and watching our favorite Christmas films. For those of you who can't go out and shop, I think it would be great to make up a bunch of goodies and have a day being cozy with your family's favorite movies, games, or puzzles. It's important right now to remember self-care and take a moment to do something that will help you and help your mental health. Even something as crazy as a a pine-scented bubble bath. I think I've seen those uh, pine-scented bath bombs. I have to admit, I'm curious about that as I love the smell of pine. Would that make me smell like a pine tree or... (laughs) Is it, would it make me smell like a uh, a terrible candle? I don't know. Maybe something you could try out. Okay, so I did just look it up online because I was curious. There are, in fact, pine-scented bath bombs. It looks like available on Etsy um, and some other places. So if that's your thing, maybe check it out. See what it's like and let me know. <laughs> I have to admit, I'm really curious about that. I might try it myself. So maybe I'll I'll have a special episode live from my bathtub. For our interview today, a couple months ago, uh, author C.J. Livingstone, you might see him going as Chris on social medias, he uh, he reached out to me with a book he had written and just had published. If you are looking for a new family Christmas story to read this year, I, I strongly recommend getting Santa Inc. by C.J. Livingstone. I'll tell you more about the story in our interview. It is essentially an orphan boy in the middle of the city of New York helps Santa find his Christmas spirit again. I know it's hard to think that Santa could lose his Christmas spirit, but you know, if there is ever a year where that could happen, maybe this is the year. And it's hard to think that Santa could lose sight of what really matters. But give the story a chance because it is is really good how he handles that. And well, I'll let the interview take it from there. And so here is the interview with author C.J. Livingstone. Uh, I was given a reader's copy of a book called Santa Incorporated by C.J. Livingstone. It says that Eric is a different eight-year-old with a vivid and untamed imagination. But in Our Lady of Mercy Orphanage, the decrepit old building where he lives, wicked sister Prudence fills the orphan boy's days with work and chores. When Eric is locked in the basement for misbehavior, he discovers a tunnel to the building next door. There he finds Santa Incorporated, uh, the global headquarters of Santa's business empire. 
This begins an adventure that changes the boys' lives forever and reawakens in Santa the true spirit of Christmas. Uh, and it's my pleasure to have the author here with us. Uh, CJ, welcome uh, to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, so I, I read what the book was about, but could you tell us a little bit more about your book and a little bit about yourself too? Yeah, absolutely. So so I'm a, I'm a writer. I actually started off well, I actually started off as a musician. And funnily enough, I made my way into writing because uh, I kind of wanted a creative outlet where I didn't have to argue with like four other people <laughs> to get my uh, idea out. So I started writing and I started writing screenplays. And uh, uh, that was back in London. When I moved to L.A., I started working for a production company and worked on a few, a few movies and I got a screenplay option. And I actually wrote Santa Inc. about 10 years ago as a screenplay. And then I kind of put it in a sh in a in a cupboard and didn't look at it. And then a, about two years ago, I pulled it back out and was like, I like this story and I want to turn it into a into a book. Really, what I was trying to do is create a Christmas story with a bit of a difference. And um, I, and I really I really like uh, authors like Charles Dickens and Roald Dahl. You know those kind of authors where. You could read it as a kid, you could read it as an adult, you could read it to a kid and everyone could enjoy it, you know, kind of like universality of of um, of the story. And so I, I really, you know, I worked on it. It took me about two years to write. And um, yeah, it was really kind of, you know, it took 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 a, some, a good amount of hard work and effort. But, you know, I was pleased with the outcome. And so far, you know, really had some good... Uh, uh, good responses back from it, good feedback from everyone I'm talking to. So I'm really pleased that it's finally getting out there for people just in time for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was glad to have read it. I couldn't wait to get it. And I got my copy. I dived right in because, you know, I, I love Christmas stories. All right. It's funny you mentioned your, uh, those people you've been influenced by because I'm, I'm reading it and I'm thinking, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling some Charles Dickens here, uh, some Roald <laughs> right. influences yeah. and um, yeah. that, that's really wonderful. Yeah, I kind of like those, uh, you know, those kind of characters, the, the, some of the dark, uh, you know, kind of wicked characters, but then ultimately how, you know, the good character manages to persevere and, and find a way through to a kind of better outcome, you know, good. So ultimately, you know, it starts in a bit of a dark place, but ends up in a in a happy place. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, it, and it gets through some dark subject matter, uh, but yeah. it, it's good. It's good. We need yeah. to, Thank you yeah. know, think, think through those things and, uh, you know, not be afraid of the the dark as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then, and, you know, it's kind of in that vein of like, you know, a Christmas carol and, mm -hmm. and, and, and even, you know, Roald Dahl stories, which always ha tend to have those, uh, those characters who are, you know, bad, bad, unredeemable characters who kind of meet their, uh, <laughs> meet their comeuppance at some point. Well, I, I don't want to give it too many spoilers away, but <laughs> there, yeah. there are a few characters like that. The book is set in New York City. Or wh why did you pick New York? Well, it's funny, funny you should ask me that because originally I was, I was debating between London or New York, right? And um, both of them being kind of an old kind of got kind of gothic elements to the city and this but also the centers of business as well uh, and also places where lots of different people come from all over the world to kind of you know make make their own way to uh, ultimately i chose new york because i i you know i just like the idea that it's the center of the business world but and, and also like where would santa go if you know if he was going to relocate from the north pole you know, I'll go to the Big Apple kind of thing. <laughs> but um, but yes, I did actually go. Um, I went to New York um, this year in about January. And funnily enough, because I currently live in California, uh, not having been to New York for a long time, I actually went with literally only a sweater to New York in January. So I soon discovered <laughs> that yeah. uh, turning up in uh, New York in January uh, with only a sweater is not a smart thing to do. So I was basically permanently cold for the entire uh, trip. But um, I went to the corner of Washington and Gansport Street, which is where the story is set. Of course, now that's basically Hudson Yard, which is tremendously well-developed. 
Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I did go there and I definitely pulled out inspiration from the city itself and, uh, you know, had a, had a good time looking around and, and going to that particular place. I've never been to New York City uh, and I can't say it's really on my bucket list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but especially like on the first two pages of your book where you're describing the city and, and all that. I mean, I got caught yeah. up in the the magic of it and to the point where yeah. I, I'm thinking, man, I, maybe this maybe this town isn't so bad. I, I, I need to go <laughs> check this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a, it's an interesting place. I mean, I mean, I'm a, I'm you know, I haven't been to New York for a long time before that. And so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed my visit there. It was great. I know uh, I, I've had some family go there uh, during Christmas time, you know, mm -hmm. to see all the, the sites and everything. And they said it's fantastic, but I'm not a huge big city fan already. Right. I, I, I live yeah. in the country and rural area. So I kind of <laughs> like a little more laid back, but <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, I, I do hope one day to get over to, to England and, and visit London and different places. And Charles Dickens is one of my favorite writers. So uh, I want to go see the museum uh, and all those things there. Oh yeah, that's that's it's great. Yeah, and there's a lot of Shakespeare stuff as well, which is oh, really sure. interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's a good place. So, uh, what what made you decide to write a, a Christmas book? You know, a lot of the stuff that comes to me in terms of where how I want to pursue ideas really it just comes as an idea, and I just I guess it was just the idea of centering in terms of kind of exploring like Christmas and then the commercialization of Christmas, mm. but then also turning it into like a bit of a magical exploration as well with these kind of slightly, well, not slightly, these, these magical elements like the elves and, you know, Santa and, you know, so just kind of some of my other books, it's funny because I've written a couple of other books that are more focused around music but they always tend to have, a, for some reason, a factory in them. <laughs> I think that's because I worked in a factory when I was about 16 years old. And I always found it to be kind of like a slightly, you know, like an interesting place, you know. A yeah. factory. It's, su it's such an in inhuman place, a factory in a way. And it's kind of interesting. Um, so I kind of wanted to combine like the, the elements of that, which is quite, you know, reality, like the stark reality with these kind of magical elements as well. And that that's really the genesis of it. And 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 I um <clears throat> I really like to um, to bring in these elements of business as well, where you because I, I I read that to my kids and I was kind of surprised that they really got it, you know, even though they're quite young, they were able to understand these kind of business concepts that you know they're not really in detail in the book but you know just the things that we generate that are generally discussed in there they they kind of got it so i always like to have a little element of like learning or you know being exposed to something you wouldn't necessarily be exposed to in a in a book like that normally to to bring in those elements too and that's kind of what made me pull all those different ideas together i'm going to let my kids read it uh, i've got yeah. two teenage boys and then a, a 11 year old daughter all right. Um, Perfect. But yeah. And I, um, I mean, I'm 40 something years old and right. I enjoyed the book. Uh, good. and you know, I think, I think this really is a good book for, uh, all ages. Yeah. And, um, you know, even if yeah. you like to read aloud to younger kids, I think this would be an excellent, uh, an excellent yeah. book for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, um, that, that's really the idea of it. I mean, my kids are a little younger than yours and, but like I say, they, they, they really enjoyed it. You know, every night we'd read like two, three chapters. I actually read it to my older son twice because the, before I even, well, it was just a printed manuscript. I was like, I need to, <laughs> I need to market test this. Right. Yeah. And, and what, what gave me like some uh, comfort is when he, you know, even two, three weeks later, he was kind of quoting bits back to me and storylines back to me. And I was like, okay, well, I feel like, you know, this is, this is hitting the right mark here. Yeah. Yeah. Kid tested. That's important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> what I, I find interesting about your, your Santa character is that it, it, you know, as the book says, he's almost like he's forgotten his Christmas spirit that right. he got caught yeah. up in the commercialism of it. And, yep. you know, we, we've been seeing kind of a movement in things like, especially movies where, where, you know, there's like a, a bad version of Santa or, 
Um, yeah. He's become bittered or angry or whatever. Um, yeah. you, you know, do you think we're kind of projecting some of our, our fears on, onto Santa here? You know, I do think that maybe it's like getting slightly older as well. You know, I think that you, um, you know, the best Christmases that I remember myself are just the ones where, you know, all my family was around me. And those were mostly in England when I was a young kid, you know, and, and you know, it was kind of simple, right? But it was a process to the day. Like I was, in one way, I was lucky. I'm an only child. Not Not only am I an only child from my parents, but like non, for most of my growing up to at least 10, there were no kids in my family except me. And so I was like the focal point of Christmas, <laughs> which for a kid is awesome, right? So I yeah, walk yeah. into the like living room at my grandparents' house and the, all the presents are kind of mine. But apart from that, which is always super exciting as a kid and, and the magic of Christmas, my, you know, my parents always, in England, you'd put a mince pie out and either like maybe a little bit of sherry which is kind of like um, like a fortified wine type thing. And, you know, the, there'd always be a bite taken out of it and a little, little bit of the sherry was was drunk. But then, you know, we'd have the breakfast and then you'd make the, you know, maybe go out for a walk and then you would uh, have the turkey, which is the tradition in the in the UK. Not, 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 not um, you, you know, here we eat turkey, obviously, at Thanksgiving. But in the UK, it's Turkey at Christmas, you know, and then and then everyone would relax and, you know, watch something like Superman on the TV or something like that. You know, so I, I kind of just but to your point, the whole idea about Christmas and the positivity about that day, I just I always feel like it's a very special day and, and try and uphold that myself. And I think maybe with, you know, commercialism and and all the rest of it, we we do sometimes lose the point of Christmas, which is if you lucky enough to have a family is to be with them and enjoy it and all the rest of it. Some may wonder how can Santa, you know, lose his Christmas spirit, but yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, it works for me. I mean, yeah. anyone, you know, doing the same thing over and over again can maybe get a little tired or, or oh, you, lose, you lose focus of what you're, yeah. of what you're doing or why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, in the story, you know, I mean, the reason he kind of has lost his Christmas spirit, he hasn't necessarily lost it, but he's just kind of reprioritized other things. Right. Yeah. And that's quite a natural human thing. I mean, I don't think I've given too much of the story away because it's kind of backstory to say, you know, Santa moves to New York because he decides that he wants to become, you know, grow a big company and be great you know, do great things. And, and, and that naturally pushes him to become a slightly different person. He has to become more serious and he has to become, he has to manage people and, you know, all the, all that stuff that comes with running a company. And it just makes him serious and a little bit jaded. And, you know, it takes, uh, takes a, a slightly different event to shake that out of him. And well, and it's great that the, the hero of the story, Eric, you know, as a kid gets, helps him find, uh, get, yeah, his priorities readjusted again. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Christmas is uh well, I guess as you know, as Charles Dickens said, that it, it it's good to have to be a child um uh, at Christmas, yeah. you know. Um you, you <laughs> exactly. Just, you yeah. see uh you see the joy of it easier. Yeah. I always like I, I like the idea too of um, you know, how kids uh, actually, you know, the idea about kids asking questions that annoy ad- adults, right? Like the (laughs) kind of like, why are you asking me this kind of stupid question? But, but by doing it, it kind of forces to an adult to like confront something they don't necessarily want to confront or reveal a truth to them that they otherwise don't want to confront. So I like the innocence of a child being able to ask a simple question that, that kind of reveals so much about being an adult. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of the characters in the book. Of course, we have Eric. Uh, we spend a lot of time with him. Yep. And he's the hero of the story. Yep. Uh, I think as it says, he's a different kid. He he is, uh, he's quite, yeah. quite the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I kind of based that a little bit on just like a combination of my, my own kids and just observing, sure. you know, you know, how kids behave and, um, just the idea about that kind of, um, 
imagination and 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 the willingness to be open to life and the world you know that sometimes we lose as an adult right and 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 santa is a case in point in this story right sometimes you lose the 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 awe of the world that ch- children generally have and it, sometimes it takes that childlike innocence to draw that you know imagination and and uh, excitement for what the world has to offer back out of people and i i love his you know when when he's faced with a problem uh you know along in the story he gets um involved with santa inc and gets yeah. a job and i just love that they hire him oh you're in a suit so you might <laughs> we'll yeah, hire right, you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and he <laughs> just has these these straight answers for things like well, you want to be more productive, have better coffee, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which yeah, exactly. I'm yeah. like, I, I'm like, okay, this kid, he gets me anyway. I, I mean, I love coffee. Right. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked in places where the coffee's rotten, right. And everyone's yep. like, this coffee is, is terrible. And they all go to Starbucks for a coffee. Yeah. It's like, just make the coffee better and everyone will work harder. Yeah. 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 Along the way, he meets some uh, great characters like uh, Huxley right the uh i guess the toy designer who lives in the basement right. mm-hmm. <laughs> i yeah. think we all need need one of those <laughs> he, huxley was a very interesting character uh you know you, you got your traditional santa claus characters you know you have santa you have the elves um yep. you know you have you have the boy who believes with eric and all, all these things but um mm-hmm. huxley's kind of an interesting character in the story uh, yeah. what was your inspiration for him I wanted to have someone who, with Huxley, he's almost like a childlike adult in a way that he's still very enthusiastic about about the potential to to create Im- amazing toys, and he's always reaching to create the most amazing toy that a child could possibly ever want. And I, I thought long and hard about that. And originally, I was I was trying to conceive myself of the best toy that a child could ever possibly want until I realized it's almost impossible (laughs) to think (laughs) of that. Right. I mean, how do you think of the, of this one single toy that every single child, boy, girl, you know, five years to 15 years would absolutely fall in love with. So, you know, it's, um, I don't think it's been invented. So, but just the, the idea that you've now got an adult who's shares that passion and also shares that that passion for kind of like crazy things, you know, like uh, just excitement and adventure as well. But he's also, he's also got this problem that, you know, he can't, he, the one thing he's striving for, he, he hasn't managed to achieve, you know, and he's yeah. feels like, you know, he, he's continuously working against that, you know? So that's yeah. really the idea. I mean, a lot of these characters kind of evolve over time. Um, but that's really, uh, you know, I wanted a, someone that shared the same enthusiasm as eric did yeah he he's kind of a grown-up version of eric almost right yeah yeah Yeah. Uh, and and for a while honestly i I thought you were going to pull a fast one and have huxley actually be santa but then i'm like okay Uh, no that's so uh i you had me on on the edge of my seat so interesting yeah (laughs) i like that because i never even thought of that myself (laughs) okay well you know he's a toy maker toy designer and all that that's right yeah that would be an interesting twist (laughs) yeah surprise (laughs) Uh, well there's an idea for a sequel for you (laughs) exactly (laughs) (laughs) and uh, uh, then there's uh mr miller in the kitchen he was a riot sister prudence as i think we could say the uh detestable uh right <laughs> bad, bad guy yeah. of this story boy <laughs> kind of like the wicked witch yeah yeah i uh i i want to read on the, your description of her because it's it's brilliant it says sister prudence whose frame resembled a bag of dead branches was thin and crooked with pallid skin that had long given up attempting to attach itself to her bones and <laughs> yeah i i just love that it's i mean I know people look like that. It's like <laughs> right. Their skin right. just given up. Yeah. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but um, what a great introduction. And, you know, if, if you finish the story thinking that Sister Prudence was a wonderful person, then, you know, you're reading the story wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. She, it was, yeah. it was nice to have a, a it was nice to have a bad guy. I don't know if that's what I, yeah. <laughs> the right, but uh, yeah, she's, <laughs> she's the bad guy here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, that kind of follows in that tradition of of people 
I mean, I suppose there's two types of bad characters, right? There's the characters that are start off bad, like the Scrooges, mm-hmm. who go through a transformative process and, and end up good. And then there's the ones who just are bad and kind of stay bad. <laughs> and yeah. she's definitely she's definitely one of them. And the other the other thing is the interesting thing, you know, observation about Eric, right, is that actually he doesn't really change through the story. He's just and and I think that's like kind of that's what kids are like. They're they just are who they are. They are them, you know, without any kind of, you know, outside influences. They just hope most of them are just themselves. Whereas the adults are the ones that kind of change, you know, mm-hmm. go back and forth, become good, become bad, all the rest of it. So that was one thing I tried to do is to have have a child bring out these changes in the adults. You know, and that that was neat too to see, I don't know, see, like even Santa, you know, readjusting his priorities. Uh, uh, you know, Huxley learns things. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Miller does. He ha- he has some great lines in there too, and uh, it's just really neat. And y- you know, you can. Uh, one of the things I like about stories, you know, is just being able to identify yourself in in a story, or right. You know, being inspired to change, or or yeah, you identify with their struggle and say, oh, okay, well. This helps yeah. me to know how to deal with what I'm going through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, uh, one level, a deeper, like a deeper level to the story is always a good thing, you know, and, and I kind of wanted to write it in that way. I think some of the best books, you can read them on different levels, right? I mean, mm-hmm. like, let's say like Animal Farm, for example, you know, is a great book where you can read it on one level and then it's got all of these deeper and deeper levels, you know, to it. Um I kind of like that approach too. Uh, would you be able to read an excerpt from your book? Absolutely. Got my copy right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will read. I think maybe the best introduction is just the first uh, chapter. Yeah, definitely. Uh, kind of covers uh, what gives you your flavor. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Chapter one, Our Lady of Mercy. This is a story set in the great city of New York, a city where buildings rise from the ground into forests of iron and stone where dreams linger on every intersection and evaporate into thin air like the endlessly billowing steam from the subway grates. From Afghans to Zambians, all colours and creeds have carved their paths from the corners of the seven continents. Four hundred years it has stood as a beacon of prosperity, freedom and the chance for a better life. A place of endless opportunity where the captains of industry walk the corridors of influence and power where fortunes are made and lost in a day, where the fabulously rich live far above the crowds in the most expensive buildings in the world. But lurking below the glamour and opulence, there is also a cruel and unforgiving side, a side that shows no mercy to those who have fallen on harder times, those for whom the great city is a manacle that is welded shut, those who have suffered at the hard end of life's twists and its proclivity for unhappy endings. On the corner of Gansvort and Washington Street in the old meatpacking district of Manhattan was a building that stood four stories high in brown brick. The year 1903 proclaimed in the mossy brick above its main entrance. It had four rows of large, slowly rotting wooden windows and a rusty staircase that clung to its exterior and was infrequently used as a fire exit. From the street, a grandiose stone staircase made its way up to a front entrance of two large wooden doors. The building looked very much like any other of its type, undistinguished in most every way and slowly falling into an old age of disrepair. Perhaps one small distinction was the three gargoyles that perched high on each corner. They were odd-looking creatures with the contorted faces, bulbous noses and wild eyes. Nobody took much notice of them and they too had grown green with the moss of neglect. It was perhaps the buildings that abutted to the left and right that condemned those four stories in brown into the realm of the ordinary and unimpressive, for it was dwarfed by two far bigger edifices that pushed their way skyward. In fact, most everything in the city was more spectacular, more eye-catching and boasting significantly more height. As a result, no one ever paid much attention to that place with its rotting windows ancient door and mossy gargoyles. It was forgotten and ignored, just like those who lived within its walls. For it was the site of Our Lady of Mercy Orphanage, 
home to boys who had no home. Nice. <laughs> Let's see. Now you only have about uh, 270 more pages to read. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like yeah. I told you, that's a, just a beautiful opening. I, I was hooked. Great. I'm so pleased that you enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you for reading that. Uh, and I, again, want to encourage people to to go get out and buy that if they're looking for a new uh, Christmas story to read this year. Now, can they order that uh on Amazon or do you have a website? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, the easiest way to get it is just go to straight to Amazon, type in Santa Inc. And it should be the first thing that comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to my website. If uh, people are interested in, um, you know, being on my mailing list or getting in contact with me, uh, if you go to cjlivingstone.com, uh, pretty much uh, find me there and on, you know, Instagram and it, uh, on uh, Facebook as well. So, um, Fairly easy to get hold of. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, one character too. I uh, we didn't talk about. I wanted to talk about real quick was uh, was Lucius. Uh, yeah, the, the little little boy. And at the you know minor spoiler here, but uh, but at near the end of the book, you know he finds his purpose in uh, helping people and yeah. and almost nurturing them or being mm -hmm. uh, maternal and. And I yeah. love the line you used there where it said that he felt strong. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. find strength in being kind and find strength in helping and and meeting people's needs. And I, I think that's that was a really powerful moment. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I, I'm glad you brought that up. It, that was almost kind of like a late addition um, to the story. And uh, what I was really trying to get to is... Um, you know, I was like, how can this character like change and become, you know, a, a, a better person or a different person? And, and and I liked the idea that he'd spent because, because you know, I'm not an orphan, but I can imagine being in an orphanage by yourself as a small yeah. child would be a horrendous experience. Right. And, and and he's continuously feeling like the people that surround him, you know, are kind of you know, his enemies and people that want to do him harm, but he suddenly finds this moment where he can, instead of, he can be kind to them, even though they've never been kind to him. And they suddenly find him, uh, they treat him completely different and it changes his life. And actually I kind of like that idea for everyone, right? Even in mm -hmm. the face of adversity, if we're all a little kinder to each other, we would probably live in a better world. So that's the kind yeah. of message, you know? Yeah, definitely. You're, you're exactly right. And at the end of all my episodes, I tell people to be kind to each other uh, right. and, and to share share your story. You know, whatever your yeah. story is, share it and be kind. It's a good message. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I like to ask my uh, visitors uh, here, what, do they have a favorite Christmas memory or a tr family tradition that uh, you just can't live without? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I do think uh, most of my Christmases in the last few years have been in uh, California, which is a somewhat odd place to have Christmas, given that it can be 75 degrees and sunny outside. <laughs> uh, I kind of like my Christmases to be, you know, in front of a fire, uh, you know, when it's basically cold and either snowy or whatever outside and, you know, kind of you're having a cozy Christmas. If That's, you right. Like. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I, I like that. And, and, and I do always think back to, you know, my, my childhood with my grandparents, uh, fortunate, fortunate to still have one of them left. And uh, unfortunately I can't get to see her this year. Uh, mm -hmm. in England. But, um, you know, those those times with your family around you, you know, just basically enjoying the day. And my grandmother, who passed away a few years ago, she would always make a thing called white sauce, which you don't really have here, but it's basically like a white custard. And it's mm -hmm. kind of made with milk, cornmeal and sugar and uh, brandy. Mm -hmm. And it's it's and you put it on a Christmas pudding. Okay. Uh, which it features it features in Santa Inc. Um, I just you'd have it one day of the year, and <laughs> it was always like a huge treat. You know, it was sure. a fant you know fantastic end to the Christmas day is to have the Christmas pudding with the the white sauce on it. <laughs> that sounds kind of good. <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah. good. It's like a custard. But, oh sure. But I yeah. don't I don't know where it I don't know where it came from or what's it it originates from, but she was used to make it and. 
it was always delicious. <laughs> yeah. On Christmas Eve, my my wife and I, after the kids go to bed, we have fondue mm, and yeah. it, we use the hot oil. So we fry little pieces of like beef or chicken. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's the only time of the year we have it is on Christmas Eve. So yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll smell like hot oil cooking or something and I'll think, oh, it yeah. smells like Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. I never fail to get excited about Christmas. I mean, that's one of the reasons I want to, you know, there's not a lot of book days of the year that we hold sacred, but I, I do mm. love Christmas day. And it's always, it always feels like a special day, Christmas day to me, you know, it's never, a, never a Christmas day when I'm like, ah, it's just another day. You know, it's, it's not, it's something about it. And un, un, kind of untan intangible. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it, it's, it's, one of the few days we all kind of hold sacred for one yeah. reason or another, but I, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I like it so much. I started a podcast about it. So <laughs> right, exactly. you really like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's and right. I wrote a book about it. So. There you go. We're, we're a couple of Christmas crazies, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, and I, uh, you know, I, I love stories and uh, I, I have some friends who are writers and trying to be writers. And, and so I knew when I started a podcast, I want to be able to help writers get get their word out about their their work because yeah. you know i've heard it's, it's pretty hard to get uh get stuff published and get that stuff out there so it's a tough it's an uphill battle i mean just writing a book is like the the easy part which is very hard in itself so <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so i appreciate you giving me the time to uh to talk about it sure thing well thank you chris for stopping by and if uh, you need to promote anything else or have any other announcements uh just give me a holler and we'll we'll get the word out cool thank you very much i, I appreciate your time you take care and have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and everyone listening. Thank you. Thank you again, Chris, for spending time with me talking about your story. If you want to hear more from him, you can check out one of the most recent Christmas Clatter episodes. He's interviewed on that podcast as well. And it looks like this Sunday, November 15th, he is going to be having a live Q&A on christmasmarket2020.com. And I told you a couple of weeks ago about this online Christmas market that's coming. Check out the website so you can get local times when these videos are. It looks like he's going to be on noon Iowa time. I expect the interview will stay posted for a while. You can watch later. But if you want to get there and watch it live, it's this Sunday afternoon. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm in the mood for a story. And today's story is called... Tilly's Christmas, written by Louisa May Alcott. Now, according to Wikipedia, that paragon of internet research, Louisa May Alcott was born November 29th, 1832, and she died March 6th, 1888. She was an American novelist, short story writer, and poet, and best known as the author of the novel Little Women. I'm not ashamed to admit that I love the story of Little Women. It's just delightful, and the opening chapters take place at Christmas time. There's been several movie versions of it. I think my favorite version is the one with Renona Ryder in it. Uh, it came out in the 90s, I believe. And I enjoyed the most recent movie version of it, too, that was written and directed by Greta Gerwig. I, I think she makes some interesting creative choices there that might have... Some purists a little upset, but, you know, I, I i mean, for what it's worth, I thought it was a pretty good movie. The story of Tilly's Christmas appeared in the short story collection Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott and published, I believe, around the time of 1872. And this is such a sweet story. Again, a lot of stories written back in the 1800s would have a, a moral for the story and they would try to teach kids good behavior and, and good character. So there is some of that in the story, and I know Louisa May Alcott can sometimes, and, 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 <laughs> and don't send me hate letters, but sometimes it feels like it can come on a little thick. But, you know, I read Dickens, so I'm used to that kind of thing. But this is a really charming story. So gather around your Christmas tree if it's up, settle in under your warm blanket, grab a cup of cocoa, and let's enjoy Tilly's Christmas by Louisa May Alcott. I'm so glad tomorrow is Christmas, because I'm going to have lots of presents. So am I glad, though I don't expect any presents but a pair of mittens. And so am I, 
but I shan't have any presents at all. As the three little girls trudged home from school, they said these things, and as Tilly spoke, both the others looked at her with pity and some surprise, for she spoke cheerfully and they wondered how she could be happy when she was so poor and she could have no presents on Christmas. Don't you wish you could find a purse full of money right here in the path? said Kate, the child who was going to have lots of presents. Oh, don't I, if I could keep it honestly, and Tilly's eyes shone at the very thought. What would you buy? asked Bessie, rubbing her cold hands and longing for her mittens. I'd buy a pair of large warm blankets, a load of wood, a shawl for mother, and a pair of shoes for me. And if there was enough left, I'd give Bessie a new hat, and then she needn't wear Ben's old felt one, answered Tilly. The girls laughed at that, but Bessie pulled the funny hat over her ears and said she was much obliged, but she'd rather have candy. Let's look, and maybe we can find a purse. People are always going about with money at Christmas time. And someone may lose it here, said Kate. So as they went along the snowy road, they looked about them, half in earnest, half in fun. Suddenly, Tilly sprang forward, exclaiming, I see it! I found it! The others followed, but all stopped disappointed. For it wasn't a purse, it was only a little bird. It lay upon the snow with its wings spread and feebly fluttering, as if too weak to fly. Its little feet were benumbed with cold, its once bright eyes were dull with pain, and instead of a blithe song it could only utter a faint chirp now and then, as of crying for help. Nothing but a stupid old robin, how provoking, cried Kate, sitting down to rest. I shan't touch it, I found one once and took care of it, and the ungrateful thing flew away the minute it was well, said Bessie creeping under Kate's shawl and putting her hands under her chin to warm them. Poor little birdie, how pitiful he looks and how glad he must be to see someone coming to help him. I'll take him up gently and carry him home to mother. Don't be frightened, dear. I'm your friend, said Tilly. And Tilly knelt down in the snow, stretching her hand to the bird with the tenderest pity in her face. Kate and Bessie laughed. Don't stop for that thing. It's getting late and cold. Let's go on and look for the purse, they said, moving away. You wouldn't leave it to die, cried Tilly. I'd rather have the bird than the money, so I shan't look any more. The purse wouldn't be mine, and I should only be tempted to keep it. But this poor thing will thank and love me, and I'm so glad I came in time. Gently lifting the bird, Tilly felt its tiny cold claws cling to her hand and saw its dim eyes brighten as it nestled down with a grateful chirp. Now I've got a Christmas present after all, she said, smiling, as they walked on. I always wanted a bird and this one will be such a pretty pet for me. He'll fly away the first chance he gets and die anyhow, so you'd better not waste your time over him, said Bessie. He can't pay you for taking care of him, and my mother says it isn't worthwhile to help folks that can't help us, added Kate. My mother says, do as you'd be done by, and I'm sure I'd like anyone to help me if I was dying of cold and hunger. Love your neighbor as yourself, is another of her sayings. This bird is my little neighbor, and I'll love him and care for him as I often wish our rich neighbor would love and care for us, answered Tilly, breathing her warm breath over the benumbed bird, who looked up at her with confiding eyes, quick to feel and know a friend. What a funny girl you are, said Kate, caring for that silly bird and talking about loving your neighbor in that sober way. Mr. King don't care a bit for you and, and never will though he knows how poor you are, so I don't think your plan amounts to much. I believe it, though, and shall do my part, anyway. Good night. I hope you'll have a merry Christmas and lots of pretty things, answered Tilly, as they parted. Her eyes were full, and she felt so poor as she went on alone toward the little old house where she lived. It would have been so pleasant to know that she was going to have some of the pretty things all children love to find in their full stockings on Christmas morning, and pleasanter still to have been able to give her mother something nice. So many comforts were needed, and there was no hope of getting them, for they could barely get food and fire. Never mind, Bertie, we'll make the best of what we have, and be merry in spite of everything. You shall have a happy Christmas anyway, and I know God won't forget us if everyone else does. She stopped a minute to wipe her eyes and lean her cheek against the bird's soft breast, finding great comfort in the little creature, though it could only love her, nothing more. See, mother, what a nice present I've found, she cried, going in with a cheery face that was like sunshine in the dark room. I'm glad of that, dearie 
for I haven't been able to get my little girl anything but a rosy apple. Oh, poor bird. Give it some of your warm bread and milk. Why, mother, what a big bowlful. I'm afraid you gave me all the milk, said Tilly, smiling over the nice steaming supper that stood ready for her. Oh, I've had plenty, dear. Sit down and dry your wet feet and put the bird in my basket on this warm flannel. Tilly peeped into the closet and saw nothing there but dry bread. Mother's given me all the milk and is going without her tea, because she knows I'm hungry. Now I'll surprise her, and she shall have a good supper too. She is going to split wood, and I'll fix it while she's gone. So Tilly put down the old teapot, carefully poured out a part of the milk, and from her pocket produced a great plummy bun that one of the school children had given her and she had saved for her mother. A slice of the dry bread was nicely toasted, and the bit of butter set by for her put on it. When her mother came in, there was the table drawn up in the warm place, a hot cup of tea ready, and Tilly and Bertie waiting for her. Such a poor little supper, and yet such a happy one. For love, charity, and contentment were guests there, and that Christmas Eve was a blither one than that up at the great house, where lights shone, fires blazed, a great tree glittered and music sounded as the children danced and played. We must go to bed early, for we've only wood enough to last over tomorrow. I shall be paid for my work the day after and then we can get some more, said Tilly's mother as they sat by the fire. If my bird was only a fairy bird and would give us three wishes, how nice it would be. Poor dear, he can't give me anything. But it's no matter, answered Tilly looking at the robin who lay in the basket with his head under his wing, a mere little feathery bunch. He can give you one thing, Tilly, the pleasure of doing good. That is one of the sweetest things in life, and the poor can enjoy it as well as the rich. As her mother spoke, with her tired hand softly stroking her little daughter's hair, Tilly suddenly started and pointed to the window, saying in a frightened whisper, I saw a face, a man's face, looking in. It's gone now, but I, I truly saw it. Some traveler, attracted by the light, perhaps. I'll go and see. And Tilly's mother went to the door. No one was there. The wind blew cold, the stars shone, the snow lay white on field and wood, and the Christmas moon was glittering in the sky. What sort of face was it? asked Tilly's mother, coming back. A pleasant sort of face, I think, but I was so startled I don't quite know what it was like. I wish we had a curtain there, said Tilly. I like to have our light shine out in the evening, for the road is dark and lonely just here, and the twinkle of our lamp is pleasant to people's eyes as they go by. We can do so little for our neighbors. I am glad to cheer the way for them. Now put these old shoes to dry and go to bed, dearie. I'll come soon. Tilly went, taking her bird with her to sleep in his basket nearby, lest he should be lonely in the night. Soon the little house was dark and still, and no one saw the Christmas spirits at their work that night. When Tilly opened the door next morning, she gave a loud cry, clapped her hands, and then stood still, quite speechless with wonder and delight. There, before the door, lay a great pile of wood, all ready to burn, a big bundle in a basket, with a lovely nosegay of winter roses, holly and evergreen tied to the handle. Oh, mother, did the fairies do it? cried Tilly, pale with her happiness as she seized the basket, while her mother took in the bundle. Yes, dear, the best and dearest fairy in the world called Charity. She walks abroad at Christmas time, does beautiful deeds like this, and does not stay to be thanked, answered her mother with full eyes as she undid the parcel. There they were, the warm, thick blankets, the comfortable shawl, the new shoes, and best of all, a pretty winter hat for Bessie. The basket was full of good things to eat, and on the flowers lay a paper saying, For the little girl who loves her neighbor as herself. Mother, I really think my bird is a fairy bird, and all these splendid things come from him, said Tilly, laughing and crying with joy. It really did seem so, for as she spoke, the robin flew to the table hopped to the nosegay, and perching among the roses began to chirp with all his little might. The sun streamed in on the flowers, bird, and happy child, and no one saw a shadow glide away from the window. No one ever knew that Mr. King had seen and heard 
the little girls the night before, or dreamed that the rich neighbor had learned a lesson from the poor neighbor. And Tilly's bird was a fairy bird, for by her love and tenderness to the helpless thing, she brought good gifts to herself, happiness to the unknown giver of them, and a faithful little friend who did not fly away, but stayed with her till the snow was gone, making summer for her in the winter time. And that was Tilly's Christmas by Louisa May Alcott. That was a really sweet story, and I think some important lessons in it for us today. I love how the act of taking care of somebody who was helpless gave Tilly, gave Tilly a sense of purpose. There was something else that needed taken care of. And it was just that simple act of charity, that simple act of showing kindness that changed the heart of Mr. King. If we really want to change the world, if we really want to make a difference in our life and in the lives of those around us, I think it's as simple as showing kindness towards others, doing something without expecting recognition. You know, in the story it says Mr. King did this, but nobody knew it except, of course, for the narrator. He didn't blast toot his own horn about it and, and you know, make this big pompous parade of, look what I have done. I have found this poor family and I, they have been suffering and I came along and gave them all these great gifts, but he did something kind and he gave them things that they needed. Look again, there was the wood that she, they needed. There was a bundle and a basket and I, I think probably clothing and blankets and things they needed and something beautiful to help decorate the winter roses, holly, evergreen. They were so grateful and so thankful. So a couple of things we can learn from the story, and that is, again, to be kind. We can change the world through kindness. You know, we might not be able to go out for Black Friday shopping. Some might have dear loved ones stuck in the hospital sick. But make the best of it and never, ever forget the hope that Christmas brings us. As my friend and fellow podcaster Todd Killian says, keep Christmas hope alive every day. And I think that's such a great reminder for us all. And that will about wrap up our episode. I do have a couple of quick announcements. Again, go to christmasmarket2020.com to see what all things Christmas have planned. Also, if you reach out and send me a Christmas memory or tradition, and I will send you a Christmas card as well as a podcast sticker, I would love to be able to feature a Christmas, one of your Christmas memories on an upcoming show. If you like what we're doing, you can help support the podcast by going to Kofi.com and donating uh, for the price of a cup of coffee. You can donate to the show and I'll use that to help keep things running. Also, I still have at least one more ornament left on my Etsy shop and all those links will be in the show notes, including a link to CJ Livingstone's book, Santa Inc. And so until next time, remember to be kind to each other and to share your stories and be sure to laugh because, as always, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. Have a very Merry Christmas.